I am pleased today to introduce today's guest speaker, Darren Walker. As one of the culminating events in our year-long series exploring our inaugural theme, Democracy in Education, I can't think of a more relevant guest for our 90th commencement. Darren has not only been a transformative leader in the nonprofit and philanthropy worlds for more than two decades, but his personal story of achievement is one that resonates deeply with our mission here at Sarah Lawrence. As president of the Ford Foundation, Darren is at the helm of an international social justice philanthropy with a $13 billion endowment and $600 million in annual grant making. The Ford Foundation has an 82-year history of vital work in education, civil and human rights, arts and culture, poverty reduction, and urban development. Perhaps Darren's path to Ford and to his work throughout his career began in 1965, when he was a member of the very first class of students to participate in the Head Start project. Perhaps it is rooted even earlier in his beginnings as the child of a single mother in a rural Texas town. In a profile celebrating the 50th anniversary of Head Start, Darren is quoted as saying, as a young child in rural hardscrabble East Texas, nothing about my journey was inevitable. I need only to look at other members of my family who were not as lucky, who did not get that first chance to understand how it powerfully influenced my life. A look through Darren's resume shows the impressive and numerous ways he has worked and continues to work to powerfully influence the lives of others. Before joining Ford, Darren was vice president at the Rockefeller Foundation, overseeing global and domestic programs, including the Rebuild New Orleans Initiative after Hurricane Katrina. In the 1990s, as the COO of the Abyssinian Development Corporation, Harlem's largest community development organization, he oversaw a comprehensive revitalization strategy. He chaired the philanthropy committee that brought a resolution to the city of Detroit's historic bankruptcy and is co-founder and chair of the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance. Darren serves on the boards of Carnegie Hall, the High Line, and the Committee to Pr Protect Journalists. He also co-chairs New York City's Commission on City, City Art, Monuments, and Markers, and serves on the Commission on the Future of Rikers Island Correctional Institution, and the UN International Labor Organization Commission on the Future of Work. He is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. With all that, he has still found the time to join us today, and we are ex very excited. Please join me in welcoming Darren Walker. Good morning. Good morning, President Judd, members of the Board of Trustees, thank you for the privilege of addressing this remarkable group of graduates. And to the deans, faculty, and staff of Sarah Lawrence, and honored guests, family and friends of the graduates, and most importantly, to you, the graduates, the class of 2018, congratulations. So as Peter said just a few moments ago, you join a prestigious group of Sarah Lawrence College graduates. And there is no telling what your future may hold. You may write chart-topping songs like Carly Simon. You may shatter industry's glass ceilings like Barbara Walters. You may become a fashion icon like Vera Wang. You may go to Hollywood and follow in J.J. Abrams' footsteps and direct the next generation of Star Wars, or maybe you will win an Academy Award as Jordan Peele did recently. But like all great, <laughs> but like all great artists, innovators, and pioneers that have walked this campus before you, you've come a long way. You've come a very long way to get here today. You've produced hundreds of pages of writing, uncovered troves of research, and you've created works of art. You've put in countless nights, chasing elusive answers, and countless more, searching to get answers, questions answered. You have worked hard, but you have not worked alone. In a moment, you will walk across this stage, and you will receive your degrees 
But as you do, I hope you pause to remember the people who have walked with you on your journey. The ones smiling up, looking at you from the stands, cheering and calling out your name. Those family members who sometimes embarrass you because they're just so loud and excited. <laughs> they are the ones who this day is also about. So you surrounded, you are surrounded today by friends, by family, by teachers, by mentors, collaborators, and partners who have made this journey with you, people who have worked hard to open doors, open doors to opportunity for you, and they have stood behind you on your journey. Their names may not appear on your diploma, but this day belongs to them as much as it does to you. So please join me and once again, recognizing and thanking all of those who have been on this journey with you. So it's important that we take the time to recognize the people who helped us along the way because sometimes we're encouraged to forget them. There's a story in this country that we like to tell ourselves, the story of the self-made American. It's the story of the entrepreneur who creates a startup in his garage, or the minimum wage worker who pulls herself up by her bootstraps. But graduates, that story is a pure fiction. Reflect just for a moment on your own life and I guarantee you, you wouldn't have made it here today without the help of others. I wouldn't be here today if it not for my mother, who moved us out of a small segregated town in Louisiana where I was born in a charity hospital. I wouldn't be here today without that young woman who turned up on a dirt road in 1965 to tell my mother about a Head Start program. I wouldn't be here without the public school teachers who encouraged me to learn and to excel, or without the private philanthropists who created scholarships for me, or a government that created Pell Grants that helped finance my college education. So the particulars of our personal stories may differ, but each of us has various people and factors in our lives that have contributed to and even paved the way for our success. If we take a moment, we can all remember people who have helped us get to this day. And I share this because it's often easy to forget that our success is not only our own. We live in a society that glorifies individual achievement where selfishness is incentivized, competition is encouraged, and cooperation is too often viewed as a weakness. It's that sense of individualism, of self-concern, that has produced some of the greatest wealth inequality in the world. Think about it. The three richest individuals in America control as much wealth as 160 Americans. Three Americans control the wealth of half the population of the country. In college, you've seen this principle at work every day. You've gotten, you've gotten this far by recognizing that inequality is something that is a part of our society. And what I want to say is each of you must be committed to addressing this issue of inequality. So let me say that in college, as you think about the people who you want to recognize, you think about, you reflect on the staff who helped you at Bates. You think about the baristas at Humboldt. They They kept you caffeinated for those all-nighters you needed. <laughs> you think about 
your dons, the people who helped you craft your agenda for learning, who helped fulfill your curiosity. But you are going to be leaving this great, great college behind. And suddenly, the built-in community that has supported you will be gone. The many friends and fellow students that surrounded you every day, they may dwindle to just a few, a few roommates, a few people in your very close-knit community. Suddenly, the things that once mattered most, friends, community, exploring new ideas, are replaced by material concerns, like getting a job and paying rent. And of course, there will be fresh joys too, new places to explore, new challenges to meet, new friends to make. But it can be tempting sometimes as busy, as busy adults in our individualistic society to retreat inward, to focus on ourselves, our work, our wants, our personal worlds. It's an attitude that reaches even the highest offices in our country. I don't think it's controversial to say that our leaders today are beholden to a broken set of incentives, or that many of the systems and structures that our society was built on reinforces inequities and discourages moral leadership. We live in a society in which our elected leaders are incented to spend more time courting donors than getting to know their constituents. When some of our CEOs sometimes act in ways that are counter to our values. And in my own sector, where philanthropists are tempted to avoid controversy rather than take a stand against injustice. The result is a vacuum of moral leadership that has made the world you are about to enter a more frightening, more selfish, and sometimes even a more violent place. But I am hopeful today. I am hopeful because in recent years, we have started to see the vacuum filled by what some would consider an unlikely source of moral leadership, the young women and men of your generation. A few months ago, a few months ago, I watched in awe, as I'm sure many of you did, as the students of the Stoneman Douglas High School, survivors of an unspeakable tragedy still fresh in their minds, led millions of young people from across the United States in the March for Our Lives. I've been inspired. I have been inspired by you here at Sarah Lawrence College protesting, as you do in that Sarah Lawrence way, protesting against injustice, like sexual assault on campuses, like fighting to protect campus workers, pushing for diversity and inclusion, and resisting white supremacists and other champions of hate. It is because of you and young people like you at Sarah Lawrence College that I am hopeful today. I'm hopeful because a 2016 UCLA, UCLA study found that this generation of college students, your generation, is more committed to protest, activism, and civic engagement than any previous generation in American history. And, and as we all know, political activism and civic engagement are nothing new to Sarah Lawrence. It was the poet and novelist and Sarah Lawrence alumni, Alice Walker, who said the following, activism is my rent for living on the planet. Think about it. Activism is our rent 
for living on the planet. Shortly, shortly you will, you will leave the supportive community that Sarah Lawrence has built for you, where it has been part of your everyday life to engage with other people and other ideas. And today you will begin the hard work of building community outside this place. And you will be tempted by all of those same incentives I just spoke about that keep so many of our leaders from acting courageously and compassionately. My hope, my wish for you is that you will engage, be active, use your privilege. As graduates of an elite college, there is no denying that you are beneficiaries of incredible privilege. All of us here today are. So wherever you go from Sarah Lawrence, whether it is to Brooklyn or Burbank, <laughs> back to your hometown or halfway across the world, I hope that you find ways to repay our society for the privileges it has extended you and contribute to the health of our world. In other words, I hope you find ways to pay your moral rent. Now this rent will look different for different people. It might look like activism on campus or acting on behalf of others. It might mean getting involved in your local community or building a more connected global community. It might mean raising your voice or lifting up the voices of others who haven't been heard. It might be your day job or something you do on the weekends or on the side. Because it doesn't matter what you do to pay your actual rent, whether you're an artist or an activist, a doctor, a lawyer, a professor, or a program officer at a foundation, anything else you can imagine, there are ways for you to pay your rent. Whatever you do, you must find opportunities to pay your moral rent. And while the form it takes will be different, the impact must be the same. To build bridges rather than walls. To inspire empathy and compassion. <laughs> to inspire empathy and compassion rather than division and disdain to champion the ideals of democracy, equality and justice for all, rather than be complacent about inequality and injustice, to give others hope in the face of fear and to lead by example when others lose their way. This is just as important as anything else you will do. Because if you neglect to pay your personal rent, you risk getting evicted. But if you neglect your moral rent, the world will forego the benefit of the contributions that you and only you can make. So graduates, I leave you with this. In 1949, a Sarah Lawrence literature professor, a gentleman named Joseph Campbell, set out to diagram the hero's journey, and he learned that all the great heroes share the same step, the call to action. It's a charge every hero receives to leave their place of comfort and begin a new adventure. So class of 2018, on this graduation day, I offer you a call to moral action. As you embark on the next great adventure of your lives, Never forget the people making the journey by your side, the people who've opened doors and lit the way for you. And no matter what path you take, become that person for someone else. I can't wait to see all the great things you are going to accomplish in the future. Congratulations on this historic day in your life.